Some video games are made to haunt you for life, and the titles on today's docket promise to deliver on just that. Trust me. The Song of Saya was the first game I thought of when the powers that be passed along the ideas for today. And buckle up folks, it's a doozy. In terms of narrative technique, the way the game worked with the unreliable narrator is fascinating. A very Marquis de Sade use of grotesque coitus as a theme. Very sublime. There's just so many elements about this masterpiece that really deserve a moment in the sun. Because yeah, this is a genuine bona fide masterpiece, worthy of a lot of discussion. Also known as Saya no Uta is a visual novel that was originally released back in 2009, authored by Urobuchi Gen, so the same creator behind Madoka Magica, Psycho Pass, and Fate Slash Zero, the game is everything you might expect from its creator. It is a brutally dark and unrelenting vision, carefully tailored to make you feel uneasy and uncomfortable at every single turn. The song follows the story of Fumi Nori, a college student who suffers major trauma in a car accident that took out both his parents. He is only saved by a highly experimental medical procedure that kind of messes with the wires in his brain completely. So now, Fuminori sees the entire world as a mass of rotten, rancid flesh, and every person in the world is a flesh monster, something so hideous and terrifying to him that he can no longer abide the world or anybody around him. But Saya is the exception. He sees her as a beautiful, innocent strike. Of course, she's not. She's actually a hideous monster that feeds on the flesh of other people, and they're driven mad at the mere sight of her. But because Fuminori sees Saya in the way that he does, she falls for him, and they enter a passionate relationship, albeit one that revolves around complete codependence on one another. The narrative cuts back and forth between the perspective of Fuminori and those who are around him, giving you a look at both the world and the disgusting, fleshy version that he sees. The cuts between the two are very much used to brilliant effect. It's all very Lovecraftian in nature, and for folks who enjoy some cosmic horror, it'll be right up your alley, and also scar your brain. Resident Evil 7 invited survival horror fans to step into the Baker's property and discover terrors never before seen in the franchise. The game was highly praised for its shift in perspective and minimalistic approach, which brought the franchise back to its horror roots. The first person perspective immediately expands the feeling of immersion, especially in a game of this nature. In the franchise's first game, it was kind of impossible to defeat all the enemies, and that is also true of the seventh installment, and for the same reasons. The resources spread across the levels are scarce and finite. Enemies, although also limited, require a significant amount of ammo to be defeated. And since you never know for sure when you'll find a boss that must be defeated at all costs, the optimal survival strategy is to save your best resources for later. That also means that, more often than not, the best thing to do in the face of an enemy is to turn around and run away. And that's where the first person perspective shines. In the previous games, running away from the zombies allowed you to see, simultaneously, the escape route, and the enemy that was chasing you. But in Resident Evil 7, this is no longer possible. There is no way to look back while running without turning completely towards the danger, which means that you never know how far your pursuer is in any escape. Thus, sound becomes a fundamental tool for survival, since it is necessary to listen carefully to the noise of footsteps, voices, and grunts to anticipate an attack coming from behind. Another reason why this installment is so scary is the bad guys, the Baker family, a whole team of grotesque monstrosities who are are going to chase you through different scenarios. Each baker controls a different location within their house and its surroundings, and within each territory, they're going to constantly find you, come back to life, and try and get you. So as players, we all get numbed down to the violence after killing the same enemy hundreds of times. But having an almost immortal threat chasing you through corridors? That'll keep the pressure going. Corpse Party is a cult classic horror game that was created by Team Cri Cri, but has since been handed off to Grindhouse's studio. So question, by the way, what defines a good horror game for you. Because in my opinion, a truly good horror game is one where you can't really fight back at all. You have no weapons or tools to defend yourself, and you just really have to use your wits and puzzle solving skills to get out alive. And Corpse Party was a great example of that. So in this game, you switch control between several students of a Japanese school as you progress throughout the game. In the opening cutscene, Satoshi, Ayumi, Shinozaki, Saiko, Mayu, and Naomi are telling scary stories to each other during a thunderstorm in a classroom at their school. Ayumi, who who is the horror enthusiast in the group, tells everybody else of a mysterious charm called Sachiko Ever After, which if done right, will grant their friend group everlasting happiness. So they perform the charm, which includes taking a little paper statuette and holding onto it as a group, and after saying, please grant me this wish, Sachiko, in your mind, they all tear it together and keep the peace they have. Well, without warning, they are suddenly transported to a hellish, dilapidated school building where they can find no exit. It's the ruins of Heavenly Host Academy, a 
school building that was torn down after a great tragedy, and the modern day new academy had since been built on top of it. With nowhere to run and dangers everywhere, Satoshi and his friends must find a way out of this horrific vacuum in the spirit world before they're all picked off one by one. The game also features multiple endings, with one true end that is canon, and multiple bad ends that can be achieved by failing a task, dying prematurely, or just making the wrong decision. This game punishes the unaware and those unwilling to read and pay attention, but it rewards those who have quick thinking and good memory skills. Although it looks a bit like a dating sim, Doki Doki Literature Club is a free-to-play psychological horror game produced by indie studio Team Sabato. And since its release, it has earned quite the reputation as an innovative scare. So it's a slow burn that begins with you and a group of cute girls who must prove that their literature club is worth becoming an official school organization. So of course, naturally, your protagonist is hoping to forge some new bonds with some of them along the way. The game encourages you to pick a girl to write a poem for, and depending on your choices, you may draw closer to the club's charming, sweet members. Eventually, and true to the game's very heavily advertised content warnings, Doki Doki Literature Club leads you down a dark path, leading to the shocking and emotional death of one character. But in the same moment that it rips your heart open, the game instantly takes a much more unusual twist. After this initial playthrough ends and the main menu restarts, the dead character's image is pixelated isolated and warped, as if her death affected the game itself. The save files become inaccessible, forcing you into a new game. If and when the player moves ahead to begin this new file, the game seems to react at any hint of this former character, and the client loudly glitches and morphs until it seems satisfied with its outcome. Soon into the next run through, the client repeatedly takes control of itself, speeding through text and tacking on unusual images to create some really grotesque jump scares. But the reality of a sentient game client becomes nightmare fuel on its own. To make matters worse, in that moment of the character's death, keen eyes will notice that the game directs the player outside of the client by naming a specific game file, alluding to an outside force changing the game's universe. It becomes a terrifying mystery, weaving in and out between the in-game plot and the game file's cryptic implications. What happened to Doki Doki Literature Club? I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream is our last entry for today, and it's partially because of the very mature themes that this game deals with. The writer of the game and the original short story, Harlan Ellison, didn't think much of video games. Games, but regardless, wanted to make something work in a, the only medium that he hadn't yet tried his hand at. And in doing so, he really wanted to explore controversial themes, guilt, forced intercourse, and the German mass extinction event. There haven't really been a lot of games that have dealt with these as themes. Like, they have been included in other games as like a historical detail or a plot point, but with most games, and for a good reason, the focus is never directly on these concerns. So this game isn't a scary game in the traditional emotional sense. There's no jump scares. There's no real immediate danger to the characters that would transfer to the player. We are playing an adventure game, and as such, we are playing Puppet Master, viewing the character's fate from a distant outside perspective. The game isn't meant to terrify you through bodily threat or atmospheric oppression. Instead, it is a very philosophical game holding up a mirror to our humanity. There are no single instances of fear, but the work as a whole is supposed to frighten the players as it unravels any facade of goodness, righteousness, or fairness in its world. It won't let you win. The best that you can hope for is to win maybe nobly? You can do everything right, redeem everyone, and forgive and show compassion to your tormentor. You can achieve clarity and transcend your baser functions, but ultimately, you're still gonna lose. Well, that's all for today, folks. I've been Alexa, your resident ooky spooky girly. See ya!